Well, great. Thank you. It's great to be here. And what a fun topic, uh, flowers. And you know, I enjoy all aspects of gardening. And one thing that I like is that there's something for everybody in gardening, whether you like vegetable gardening or trees, shrubs, landscaping, flowers. Uh, I like it all. And it's going to be fun today to talk about flowers, uh, growing flowers for fun or profit. And as flowers uh, make our homes and cities just so beautiful. There's so much that we can do. Uh, and now humans have a long history with flowers. Uh, we've been growing flowers for beautification ever since the days of the ancient Romans and Greeks. And of course, Europe has a long history with flowers. The palaces and public gardens uh, in old Europe were filled with flowers. And many of those same traditions uh, from Europe uh, of their love of flowers came with uh, our immigrants when they came to this country. So many of our ancestors, our parents and grandparents, uh, great grandparents, many of them when they came to this country brought that tradition of enjoying flowers with them. So for many of our early settlers, after they got their houses built and maybe their barns built, then uh, decorating the outside of their homes with flowers uh, was just unnatural. In fact, on many old homesteads, you can still find peonies uh, that were planted in the days of the homestead. So we have a long history of enjoying flowers. And they just, they make our yards and businesses so beautiful. And in many ways, flowers just make summer come alive for us, it's just natural. Now, whether we're growing flowers for fun or for profit, many of the principles are the same. Uh, the growing principles, the care that the flowers take are much the same. Whether you're growing flowers in your backyard or whether you're growing them acres and acres um, for a livelihood, the basic care is very much the same. Now, when we talk about flowers, there are really two broad categories of flowers, uh, annual flowers and perennials. So we're going to talk about those two types today. There's actually a third type called the biennial, but there aren't many flowers uh, that are actually like that. Those are ones that live only two years specifically. So let, let's talk a little bit about each of the main types of categories. Uh, now, annual flowers. Annual flowers are types of flowers that just uh, live for one growing season. What they do is they uh, grow, uh, produce a flower, then they make a seed head, and then their purpose in life is done, they die over winter. Uh, so annual flowers just live for the one growing season. Uh, oftentimes they're referred to as simply as annuals or bedding plants. Now take a look at the photo of marigolds. Notice the dry flowers. Uh, and those dry flowers are going to produce a seed pod. And that is an annual's goal in life is to produce that seed pot. We're going to talk about removing those later. So it's interesting, the life of an annual flower. Uh, the next category are perennial flowers. Uh, oftentimes in flower gardening, there's something called perennials. Now those are plants that live for two or more years. Uh, they're plants that die to the ground during winter and then come back in the spring. So perennial flowers living more than just one season. And if we take a look at, um, if we take a look at uh, annual flowers, a few more growing things about annual flowers. Uh, annual flowers are really unparalleled in color and excitement. Uh, there's just so many different types, the colors, the heights. A fascinating thing about annual flowers is that they produce their bloom for most of the growing season. They start blooming early and continue right on through till frost. That's one of the main advantages is that they can, uh, they have that long summer time of bloom. And of course, one of the disadvantages is that they do need to be uh, replanted each year. 
So if we take a look at some of the growing uh, techniques for annual flowers first, one of the key points is to fit the annual flowers into whether they like sun or shade. For example, on the left side, the zinnias are uh, sun loving. Uh, they can take a full all day sun. On the right side are the uh, impatience. And impatience and some other types of annuals prefer the shade. So it's a key point to fit the flowers into their preferred light, whether sun, shade, or part. Uh, for full sun, uh, those flowers should really have a full eight hours of sunlight each day. Now let's take a look at some ways that we could use our annual flowers. Of course, you could do a flower bed composed completely of annual flowers. That's fun. The entire flower bed, you can uh, create it very nicely with totally annuals. Or another good way is to combine annuals uh, with perennial flowers. Annuals work very well tucked in between the perennial flowers. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. A third way to use annuals are in containers. Our uh, pots and planters, we can use those on apartment balconies, decks, doorsteps. The nice thing about annuals in containers is that we can use those in spots that you don't have soil for a flower bed. You can still decorate and have the advantages of flowers even without uh, needing a, a regular flower bed. Let's talk a little bit about using annual flowers in a flower bed. Uh, annual flowers love organic material. So uh, when you start the annual flower bed, if you work in organic material, things such as compost or um, peat moss, uh, bags of uh, manure work well, you can add up to about three inches of that material over the uh, flower bed and work that in. And, and then when you plant, uh, those annuals are really going to enjoy that. On how to plan a flower bed, an annual flower bed, you could put those in rows as we see on the photo to the left. Annuals in rows are very beautiful. That gives kind of a little more of a formal look. And in some spots that uh, it really looks well. Another away on the right side, the lower right side photo, shows annuals used in a little more of a random pattern. And now I like to say it's a random pattern, but yet we, we plan the randomness. For example, we need to take a look at the height. Uh, if we take a look at the plant tag uh, to see the height of the annual flowers. So that generally you're using the taller material to the back and the shorter growing material toward the front. But even in a, kind of a random natural, that can give a very good look too. Another point about annual flower beds is the fall cleanup. And of course, since annual flowers do not come back each year from the roots, uh, in the fall, it's wise to clean them up. If you wait until the next spring, oftentimes the tops have become kind of limp and, and uh, more difficult to deal with. One thing that I've enjoyed doing in our own annual flower beds in the fall is simply running over them with a lawnmower. That might sound a little funny, but after they've uh, been killed by frost, uh, you can chop up that material and return it back into the, uh, the soil. It makes a good organic material. So uh, setting your lawnmower fairly high and mowing over several times, that grinds it up good. Now, if any of the material uh, was diseased, for example, if it had the grayish powdery mildew, we should remove that and not work that back in uh, to the soil. Uh, so a good way to return that uh, material back, and that helps to improve our soils. Annuals combine very well with perennials. So that's another good way to use annual flowers. Uh, take a look in the photo of how the green hosta uh, are interplanted with impatience, uh, both like shade. And notice how the colorful red impatience give pops of color in that. 
So a wonderful use of annual flowers is in amongst perennials. Another way, of course, that we mentioned about using annual flowers is in containers. And there's a fun way to design a container. And it's kind of easy to remember. It's uh, with a designing with a thriller, a spiller, and a filler. Now, the thriller is something eye-catching. For example, take a look at the, the photo. The caladiums, which are kind of the pinkish red, larger leafed plant, the, the caladiums would uh, be considered a thriller, something to kind of catch the eye, something that makes the planter pop. And a spiller would be the sweet potato vine, which is the light, bright green material. The spillers uh, spill over the edges of the container, giving a nice pleasing natural look. And the third thing is a filler. The purple leaved material is called purple heart and the purple heart kind of spreads and fills in. There are a few other plants in the container too, but anytime you have a chance to design and plan your pots and planters, try doing it with a thriller, a spiller and a filler. It gives a nice look. Another tip about growing annual flowers is that they're considered heavy feeders meaning that they like a lot of nutrition. And it does take a lot of nutrition in order to keep blooming as long as the annual, annual flowers should. Now, a couple of ways we can produce or provide that nutrition. In a flower bed, you could incorporate a fertilizer, either a chemical type or an organic fertilizer. You can incorporate those that at planting time. A couple of other fertilizer types. Uh, if you notice on the left hand uh, slide is a product um, that is a slow release fertilizer. That works very well for pots and planters. The label tells how much to apply to a certain diameter pot and that type of slow release fertilizer will give nutrition for a month, uh, oftentimes the entire growing season. On the right hand of the screen, we see the, the water soluble type of fertilizer, and that works very well too. Now, if you read the directions on the slow release granules, uh, the directions oftentimes say that you can supplement that with the water soluble type fertilizer. So you can use both. Water soluble type should probably be applied every two weeks or so. So that nutrition is very important for keeping annual flowers blooming as long as possible throughout the summer. Another tip for growing annual flowers and keep them blooming as long as we can is a process called deadheading in garden terminology. And deadheading means that you remove the spent or withered flowers before they set a seed pod. See, as we mentioned before, an annual's purpose in life is to flower, produce seed, and then die. If we can prevent seed pod formation, the annuals will continue blooming and trying for much longer. So to remove that seed head, it's important not just to remove the withered flower petals, but to remove the enlargement at the base. Uh, for example, the petunia seed head on the right hand, if we just take off the withered flowers, we are not getting the seed pod. So it's important to uh, go right below the withered flower petals and remove that seed pod. That's the type we're trying to prevent so the annuals will keep blooming. Well, how do we go about getting our annual flowers? How do we, how do we obtain them? Well, one way is to visit garden centers and to buy transplants. Uh, oftentimes these are sold in multiple packs. Uh, such as the petunias and vinca, or the um, marigolds and vinca shown here. Uh, they may be sold in six packs or four packs, uh, oftentimes called cell packs. Another way to buy annual flowers at garden centers is in individual pots. Many of the plants that are sold for container gardening are sold in individual pots as well. 
Another fun way to get your annual flowers is by starting them yourself from seed indoors. And my wife Mary and I enjoy doing that. This is uh, me transplanting uh, petunia seedlings uh, grown from lights uh, in our basement, fluorescent lights. So it makes a fun hobby too. So we can grow our own annuals started from seed indoors. A third method is direct seeding flowers outdoors. Now that's not the preferred way because it takes a long time for annual flowers to germinate and grow a green plant and begin blooming. So if you plant flower seed directly outdoors into a flower bed in the soil, oftentimes they won't start blooming until maybe well into July or August. There are some very fast growing types that that does work for. Uh, some of those are zinnia, cosmos, four o'clocks grow fast, uh, maybe sometimes marigolds. Uh, nasturtium is another one. Uh, other, other than possibly those, uh, it's wise to start with plants that have already been started. In fact, each of these types also, zinnia, cosmos, marigolds, four o'clocks, they can all be planted from pre-started plants and then they bloom that much quicker. Now let's go on and talk about perennial flowers and some of the tips for growing perennials. Now perennial flowers are plants that live for two or more years. Uh, and sometimes the perennials that we grow in our flower beds are called herbaceous perennials. Uh, and that's because they, the tops uh, die back to ground level each winter and then they come back from the base. Now trees and shrubs are perennials too because they live from year to year. Uh, those are called woody perennials because they burst forth, they bud forth from the woody tops each year. So perennials that are considered winter hardy for our region, each year they're coming from ground level. And of course that is a key point, winter hardy. Uh, perennials vary greatly in their ability to survive in a given region. Uh, now our uh, hardiness zones, our U.S. Department of Agriculture hardiness zones, uh, most of us in North Dakota and Minnesota are considered in zones three and four. Most of us are zone four, zone three in the northern reaches. So when a person is choosing perennials to plant, it's important to look for those that would be winter hardy in hardiness zones three and four. So they need to really survive winters down to about 35 degrees below zero. And so uh, those will be winter hardy perennials. Now those uh, winter hardy perennials are coming back ground level each year. And if we were to dig up perennials, we find that there are some several different structures below ground from which they are arising. And one way, as shown in the picture, is some perennials grow from a very fibrous root system very fibrous. Uh, and uh, sometimes when you're reading garden books or magazines, you'll hear the term, the crown, crown of perennials. And the crown is the area between the roots and the above ground stems when they grow. Uh, and that's important to tell where the crown is because that's the point if you want to divide a perennial, uh, we divide down through the crown of the perennial. So good term to know. Other perennials grow from a bulb, the structure that's coming back each year. For example, hardy lilies. Uh, when we dig those up, we would find that they're coming from a bulb and the hardy types of lilies, that bulb is uh, winter hardy enough uh, so it survives well. And so each year they come back from a, a bulb underneath. Yet other structures uh, that are uh, surviving underneath. Uh, look at these iris. The enlarged portion is actually a modified stem called a rhizome. So iris grow back each year from a rhizome. Uh, the true roots are below that rhizome. Kind of fun botany. Now some of the underground structures uh, from which plants grow are not fully hardy. Uh, these are gladiolus corms. 
and um, they aren't winter hardy enough to last. If we were way down south in the United States, uh, we might be hardy. Uh, it, it, these might be hardy enough to last over winter. But in our area, these structures, such as gladiolus, need to be dug each fall, about the time of frost, and then brought and stored in indoors and then each spring we could plant them back out again. In that category besides gladiolus are the cannas and dahlias, um, tuberous begonias, things such as that. They kind of act like a perennial if we dig them up, store them, and then plant them out. Ah, some ways that we can use perennial flowers. Now they can be a, in a flower bed all their own. That looks beautiful. We also mentioned they can be combined with annual flowers, and that looks great too. Now notice how good these perennial tulips look in the landscape. Perennials, not just tulips, but all, almost all types of perennials could be planted in amongst the shrubbery in our foundation plantings. And that gives color. Many of our uh, shrubs uh, you know, don't have much blooming, but annual um, perennials added can give very nice color to our landscapes. Another thing that's very important uh, is to consider the lifespan of a perennial. Now, even though all perennials live two years or more, some of them have longer lives than others. Uh, so some are long-lived, some are short-lived. Now, take a look at the peonies down kind of in the left-hand portion of the photo. Now, perennial um, peonies, uh, have been known to live for centuries. Even in North Dakota, there are many pioneer peonies uh, still living. So peonies have a very long life. Some such as bleeding heart, hosta, daylily, iris, uh, long-lived perennials. Other types of perennials, such as the delphinium here, have a shorter lifespan. Uh, they may uh, live for three to five years, then sometimes they need replacement or digging and dividing. Even though they have a shorter lifespan, they're certainly worth uh, planting. They're beautiful, aren't they? But we should keep in mind that certain perennials have long lives and others uh, have a shorter lives. And so then we, we replant as we need. For a successful perennial bed, it's very important to combine uh, a number of different uh, types of plants. Uh, the reason for that is that most perennials have a certain bloom time. Uh, most of them bloom for a two to six week period, either in spring and early summer or midsummer or fall. So when planning a perennial flower bed, it's important to choose types from each of those blooming types, uh, blooming seasons. So choose some perennials that bloom early spring, some in midsummer, some in fall. And by doing that, you'll have color throughout. And if you locate in a perennial bed, locate some of those from each blooming season kind of throughout, then your perennial bed will be always changing and it will look nice and have bloom throughout the summer. One of the beauties of a perennial flower garden is that it's continually changing as the different types bloom. There are few, if any, perennial flowers that bloom from spring until frost. Most of them have their specific bloom period and that's why we combine the different types. Just like we did with annual flowers, with perennial flowers, we need to examine the type of light that they preferred. Some uh, perennials love the shade, such as on the left side, the hosta and bleeding heart and ferns. Um, they love the shade and that's where they do their best. Other perennials like the iris on the right side need full sun in order to bloom their best. And so when deciding what to plant and where to plant it, make sure that uh, we investigate the light requirements. For example, if the sunny iris were put in the shade, they just don't bloom as well. And hosta that like the shade, uh, they, they certain types of hosta might not do well in the sun. 
Now, perennials give us a chance uh, to be patient. Uh, now, perennials, it does take them uh, a few years to develop a root system and a structure in which they can burst forth in bloom. So many perennials will take up to about three years. And then in that third year, they'll uh, begin their nice full bloom that we're accustomed to. And then they'll bloom strongly uh, thereafter. But uh, that gives us a chance the first few years to, uh, to be patient and they're well worth waiting for. Nearly all perennials love soil that has been amended with organic material, such as peat moss, compost, uh, bags of manure. Now perennials, um, since they like organic materials so much, uh, can be planted into soil in which we've already added the organic material. At plant, for example, if you're starting a brand new perennial bed, um, we can incorporate those materials from the start. Even if we have an existing perennial bed that maybe doesn't have much organic matter in the soil, uh, we can add uh, handfuls and then kind of work that in around. Perennials uh, grow much better in a soil rich in organics. Uh, and it's always important too to check the height and the width of perennials uh, so that we don't locate uh, short growing perennials behind the tall ones. So we should kind of plan our perennial beds uh, so that we are situating them right. All very important is to look at the width or the spread of each perennial type so that we give each of them the footprint that they need in order to develop and grow so that our perennial beds don't become crowded. Now, when you first develop a perennial bed, the first year of planting, it's maybe gonna look a little bit skimpy because we're allowing the room for them to grow and develop. A uh, good technique is to, during that first year especially, maybe put some annual flowers in between the blank spaces just to, to kind of give a person something more to look at uh, while the perennials are developing. Mulch is very important in a perennial bed. We mentioned that uh, perennials like a soil rich in organic material. Uh, they also tend to like a cooler soil and a good layer of mulch, three to five inches uh, of wood product mulch uh, does wonders. It can even be compost, does wonders for keeping the soil cool. It helps conserve moisture. Also, it helps diminish the weeds. Now, a common question is, should we be adding landscape fabric under that mulch? Now, perennials do grow better if they just have the mulch applied over the soil without the landscape fabric. Landscape fabric can be used on perennials, but uh, uh, the perennials seem to like it better without. Plus, if weeds get started through that landscape fabric, it makes it a little more difficult. So just a good layer of mulch over the soil in a perennial bed. And we don't necessarily need the landscape fabric. We mentioned in annual flowers, the importance of deadheading to remove the withered blossoms. And that's equally important with perennial flowers uh, because forming a seed pod uh, is a, an energy drain. And the energy, instead of going into seed pod formation, which they don't need, uh, that energy can go into forming a better uh, plant structure. And it can go into uh, energy for the plant so that they will bloom better the following year. So as soon as the blossoms wither and before the seed pod is enlarging, remove the withered blossom, including the seed pod. Now, uh, when Mary and I had our greenhouse business, uh, sometimes uh, customers would ask for perennials because uh, they wanted to do something with which they didn't have to work any longer. And that's kind of a nice idea in theory, but actually perennials aren't necessarily less work than annuals. It's true that you don't need to plant them each year, but um, some of the things such as weeding can actually be a little more difficult. Some of the perennial type weeds establish uh, closely within the crown of perennials. Uh, dandelions are a good example. 
uh, quack grass, thistles, uh, can easily become embedded in the central crown of perennials. That makes uh, getting rid of weeds a little bit of a challenge. But if we keep with them, we can persist. Now, ways to control weeds in a perennial flower bed, we can hand dig. Uh, if a person makes the rounds, you know, several times a week, you can get some of these weeds when they're young. Um, yeah, I like to think of that as giving us a chance to view the flowers, you know, and then uh, you pull some weeds uh, or dig them out as you're working. Another way is the mulch that we mentioned. If you put mulch, and for weed control, it really has to be about five inches thick, uh, we, mulch can help suppress weeds. There are some weed preventative, uh, preventive products. Uh, one commonly seen on the market is one called Preen, P-R-E-E-N, Preen. Now those are products that need to be applied. They're gra usually granules that are applied to flower bed soil but the flower bed soil has to be weed free. They prevent weed seeds from sprouting um, and they can help reduce, not totally eliminate, but sometimes reduce the hand weeding. If some of the perennial weeds become established, we can spot spray with an herbicide, but great care needs to be taken because most of the herbicide chemicals that would kill weeds would also injure uh, would also injure perennials. Uh, weed control in perennials uh, can be a whole topic full for a whole series as well. well. Let's talk about dividing perennials, digging and dividing. Now sometimes perennials as they grow become quite large in a clump. Uh, there's a way to tell if your perennials need digging and dividing and that's to look at the center of the clump. If the good, healthy parts of the perennial are all on the outside perimeter, and if the center of the clump has become old and woody and not growing, that's a good sign that the perennial should be dug and divided. Uh, we dig it up, um, take the good parts, the vigorous parts from the edges, and then reset that. Now, some perennials like iris, which are in the upper left-hand corner on the screen, Iris uh, benefit from dividing about every four years. You just dig them up uh, and then reset a good healthy clump. On the right hand side in the photo are peonies. Now peonies, uh, they can last many decades. And as long as they're growing and blooming and the plant looks healthy, there's really no need to dig and divide if the plant looks healthy. Now, how do we know what season to dig and divide our perennials. Maybe you've heard that uh, some need dividing in the fall and September, some in the spring. How do we know? There's an easy rule of thumb to remember, and that is uh, the time to dig and divide a perennial is the season opposite its bloom time. For example, if a perennial blooms in spring or early summer, you divide in the fall. Okay, an example would be tulips. Uh, if you're dividing tulip bulbs, uh, which bloom in the spring, you do that in the fall. Also peonies, which bloom in early summer, late spring, early summer, peonies are always divided in the fall, in September. In the central photo, we see mums, chrysanthemums, which are a beautiful fall blooming perennial. Now, since they bloom in the fall, mums are always divided in the spring. So you choose the season opposite of the bloom time. If the bloom happens to be in the middle of summer, then what do we do? For example, tall flocks that bloom in July and August, uh, generally those are done in the springtime. So what forms do we buy perennials in? Now let's take a look. On the left-hand side, we see dormant roots. And sometimes you can buy dormant roots of perennials in the uh, spring of the year, and sometimes in the fall of the year. Things such as hosta and daylilies, um, peonies, those are oftentimes sold as dormant bare roots. Other uh, ways of obtaining perennials in the 
picture the central lower, we see perennials that are already growing in pots uh, as would be sold in a garden center. So that's a good way to start, uh, get a start on perennials. Uh, on the right hand side, some of the perennials are planted from a bulb, such as tulip bulbs and lily bulbs are sometimes also uh, planted. Uh, you can buy potted lilies, but oftentimes you just plant the dormant bulb. I might mention a fourth way to get uh, perennials, and that's if you get divisions from a friend or a neighbor. You can dig at the appropriate dividing time and get your start that way as well. Now let's talk a little bit about what we do with a perennial bed in the fall. Um, in the fall, we, we used to think that a perennial bed should be cleaned up in the fall, get it all cleaned up. But then we discovered that perennial flowers actually survive winter best if the tops, the above ground portion, uh, if the tops are left on over winter. Now take, take a look at the photo. Isn't that pretty? You know, there's beauty in the tops of uh, perennial flowers, even in the winter. Uh, you know, of course, if we get deep snow, then you don't uh, see them for salon. But isn't that beautiful? Even in the fall and winter, a perennial garden, the mixture of, of uh, browns uh, can be really, really quite pretty. Uh, but the main concept, of course, is that they survive winter better. The tops help to catch snow, which is a great insulator. And so the winter survival is almost always best if you just leave the tops on, don't clean them up in the fall, and then uh, remove the tops by cutting back in the spring before the new growth starts emerging from the ground. Now there are a couple of uh, types of perennials that should be cut back in the fall. And one of those is peonies. Uh, peonies tend to harbor the grayish powdery mildew disease. And cutting the tops back to about an inch above ground level in the fall after frost and disposing of those tops uh, instead of leaving them lay, but disposing of them, that, that can help reduce the disease. A couple of other types of perennials that do benefit from cutting back in the fall um, are hosta, daylilies, and iris. The reason for that is after they freeze and get a little snow, the tops just kind of turn to mush over winter. And next spring, it's a little difficult to clean those up. So those types, iris, um, hosta, daylily, we may as well cut those back in the fall. And, but the rest of the tops uh, really are best left on. Now, if you have some, um, perennials that might be a little tender or maybe the first year until they really get established, they can benefit from a covering of leaves, leaves or straw, a good layer, 12 to 24 inches uh, uh, placed over the perennials. Now it's important to wait until the ground has frozen. So protective mulches would usually be put on in uh, November, the first half of November. Uh, the object of a winter mulch is to keep the perennials comfortably frozen uh, and to prevent freezing and thawing. If we put the mulch on ground that is warm and thawed, the perennial crowns can actually rot under that. So we let the ground freeze and uh, then apply the protective mulch and that keeps them what I like to call comfortably frozen uh, for the winter time. And then that protective mulch would be removed in spring uh, be before any growth would start from below. Now these same principles apply really if you're growing annuals and perennials for fun or if you're growing them for profit. And it's kind of fun to see flower farms uh, where they're growing acres and acres um, Flowers are oftentimes grown for cut flowers. Um, so a few ways that if you would like to grow uh, flowers for profit, there's a few ways you can do that. Now there's a high demand for cut flowers uh, at farmers markets and also we can wholesale them to florists. Uh, some types that work very, very well for cutting 
are the gladiolus uh, shown here. Gladiolus, uh, they store well, keep well, and that uh, really works well. Another way that a person can make profit from flowers would be to uh, start a greenhouse, small or large, and raise the bedding plants uh, for sale in a greenhouse. Uh, we, you would be starting from seed and uh, transplanting into uh, cell packs to create a finished uh, pack of flowers, such as the marigolds or petunias or tomato plants that we would buy at a garden center. Or another alternative for growing flowers for profit would be to uh, grow them, such as in a field situation, for the underground structures. Um, let me give an example. If we have a, a peony root, uh, we could divide that peony root into small sections. Each one needs to have uh, several of the buds or eyes down below in the roots, but we could take a large peony, divide it up into sections, plant those out, then in another year, dig those up, multiply them, and eventually we would have quite a few peony roots that we could dig and, and sell. Uh, the same thing could be done with hosta or daylilies. We can multiply them in a field situation and then dig, divide, and sell those. Now, anytime we would be doing some of these things, it would be important to check with the State Department of Agriculture to see if there are any restrictions or guidelines when uh, growing some of these things for profit or end sale. Well now, so whether we're growing annuals or perennials and whether we're doing it for fun or profit, growing flowers is fun. I have enjoyed it my entire lifetime. And you know, I, I'd hate to think of our summers uh, without flowers. They mean a lot to us, especially after kind of a long winter. Now I um, will open up for questions. And Scott, are you able to share the questions with me? Uh, yes, Don, uh, I can read them to you from the chat, or if you want to click on the, you know, on the bottom uh, next to the share button is the chat button too, and you could go ahead and read them. I think there's only uh, one that's come through so far. Okay, on my, on my computer, I, I'm not seeing the chat box, so sure. if you wouldn't mind reading them, that would be great. Yeah, that's fine, and this person actually sent it privately to me anyways, or thought they were sending it to Julie. <laughs> so if anybody sends them to Don personally, I, uh, he won't see them, but yeah, go ahead and send your chat messages, type them down in the uh, bottom right-hand corner. Um, make sure it says everyone, and then just go ahead and type, and then I will read them to Don. So first one, Don. Um, what annual flowers can we start indoors now from seed for a zone three climate? What annual flowers can we start indoors from seed? Uh, the, importance, uh, the important concept when starting annual flowers indoor from seed is to check the preferred recommended starting date. Uh, if we start annual flowers, and the same holds true with vegetable plants, if we start them from seed too early, the plants tend to get too large and languish indoors. So for most uh, perennial, or excuse me, for most annual flowers, they begin, um, the earliest to begin would be about March 1st, uh, seeding things such as petunias about March 1st. Then about March 15th would be items like marigolds. Uh, and uh, my wife and I enjoy starting these plants under fluorescent lights in our own basement. And so for quite a number of years, we've kind of used that uh, calendar. So beginning about March 1st, uh, the only items that would require starting earlier, because they take a long time to grow, one would be begonias, begonia seed. They could be started now in February. And also one called lisianthus, beautiful annual flower, but takes a long time to grow from seed, uh, would be really January. And if you were to grow geraniums from seed, uh, really January also. But most geraniums uh, we gr are grown more like from cuttings and bought from a greenhouse. So starting geraniums from seed isn't as common. I might, might mention too, um, at the end, uh, Scott, if we share my like email address, 
I can certainly um, provide the calendar of when to start some of these things. But as a rule, uh, March 1st, March 15th, and then April 1st is when things such as zinnias would be started from the 1st to the 15th. Yeah, I'll go ahead and drop your email down in the chat here. That'd be um, great. Okay, so the next question from Kristen was, do you make any special considerations for deer when choosing perennials? Yes, now that's a great, uh, great question. Uh, any special considerations for deer? And now I've, I've battled deer for, uh, well, let's see, probably 40 years or so. And repellents are kind of hit and miss. Some work, some don't. Um, now it's interesting also, sometimes a person will see published lists of deer, deer proof plants, whether they be annuals or perennials, deer proof. But if deer are hungry enough, they will eat almost anything. And what I've noticed is some of the plants on those lists that are supposedly deer proof, I've experienced deer eating them. So, you know, it's personal preference on the deer's taste. Um, but some things that they particularly enjoy, uh, deer seem to love hosta and they love lilies. And, but to, to plant certain materials and not have the deer affect them uh, usually doesn't work. The better ways are to try to um, use some of the most effective repellents. And the most effective repellents, uh, there's a couple of types. One, the ingredients are um, uh, rotten eggs, garlic, and soap. It sounds kind of funny, but those are the ingredients in um, the repellents, such as the one called liquid fence. Liquid fence. Uh, another uh, ingredient that is in some of the other products is uh, blood and a product called plant skid. Plant skid is a repellent that has blood in it. So if a person kind of looks at the ingredients, um, those are the two types. Uh, and of course, repellents have to be applied fairly regularly. And so deer are definitely a problem. And, um, but um, there are really no deer proof perennials as, as such. Okay, thanks. Um, from Charlotte, she asks, can you dig and divide hollyhocks? Dig and divide hollyhocks. Now, we mentioned how um, perennials uh, or flowers, most flowers come, are in two broad categories, perennials and annuals. There is actually a third one called biennials that grow one year and flower the next, second, then die. Biennial meaning two. Hollyhocks are a biennial, meaning uh, they grow the first season, then produce a flower stalk the second, but they also drop their seed. So at any time in a hollyhock uh, flower bed, you usually have new little seedlings coming up. So they kind of act like a perennial. So uh, instead of digging and dividing, you're actually digging up little seedlings. So yes, in the spring of the year, if you see little, uh, they're probably actually seedlings, but if you see those around kind of what was the original plant, yes, in spring, as soon as you see a little growth, then uh, you can reset those. And also, um, if some of the older plants too that maybe haven't exceeded their two year, you can dig and divide that. So the answer is yes, you can uh, be separating and dividing uh, hollyhocks as well. All right, uh, next one here is from Lila. Uh, in regard to mulch in perennial beds, can annuals densely planted among the perennials take the place of mulch? That's and, a great, great question. Yeah, uh, she, was, add, she adds mm -hmm. to that, uh, she adds to that, doesn't break down of woody mulch deplete some nitrogen, although I understand eventually that isn't an issue. Okay, so let's, let's talk about mulch on perennial flowers. Uh, we mentioned, uh, you know, three to five inches of wood product mulch, and in time that will uh, decompose, and right on the surface, uh, a person would probably see a little bit of nitrogen depletion because you see the, the organisms that decompose the wood uh, use a little nitrogen in the process, but it wouldn't sap enough nitrogen out of the root system to show any measurable 
uh, effect. So uh, generally, it, uh, wood mulch does not adversely affect the nutrient content. A person could add some 10-10-10 well-balanced fertilizer just for good measure or an organic type fertilizer. But generally, the uh, the rotting type organisms won't suck that much nitrogen or fertilizer out. Now, that's a good question about using annuals in amongst perennials. That's a good idea. Annual, most annual flowers don't have a root system that will be that vigorous because they only grow for one season. So most annual flowers have a fair, fairly mild root system in most cases. So they blend well with perennials. The advantage of some annuals in amongst the, that would shade the root system, keeping the perennial roots shadier and conserve moisture. And plus the use of annuals among perennials kind of bridges the bloom time because most of the annuals uh, bloom uh, most of the summer season. So annuals and perennials are very uh, compatible. So yeah, good idea. Okay, thanks. Uh, the next one is from Diane. She's asking, when do you transplant rhubarb? When do you transplant rhubarb? Great question. Uh, rhubarb, the old time-honored method is uh, digging and dividing rhubarb in the fall around Labor Day, it's September around Labor Day. That works beautifully. The second time that it can be dug and divided is in early spring, just as a little bit of growth is starting to poke out of the ground. Uh, so probably well, late April, maybe the first part of May, depending on the season, just as soon as you see a little bit of life, so you can kind of see what you're digging and dividing. That is the secondary time. Okay, uh, next one's um, from I'm not so sure I'm saying the name right, but Beryl, um, what time of the year would you recommend to start Cleome from seed indoors? Cleome from seed, that's a, and if you, if you aren't familiar with uh, Cleome or Cleome, look it up, beautiful, tall annual flower. Uh, we enjoy growing that each year. And Cleome uh, usually started about the 1st of April, the 1st to the 15th of April. Cleome grows fairly, fairly rapidly, so we don't want to start it too early. Now, Cleome is interesting. Uh, the germination improves if you put the seed in the refrigerator for two to three weeks. Uh, before before your planting time. So that, that can help improve the germination also on Cleome. Okay, well, there's, there's two more here. Um, okay. uh, does the same sprays apply for deer repellent also to rabbits in the landscape? Yes, the deer, deer repellents and rabbit repellents, the most effective ones, uh, yeah, are uh, work for both. And, um, in most cases, uh, they need to be reapplied after, uh, after heavy rain. Most of them have uh, the ones that I mentioned, um, uh, like, such as liquid fence or plant skid. I think another one is called deer away. Those products have kind of a spreader sticker type material. So in most cases, they'll last about a month or after a heavy drenching rain. And for rabbits, anytime we can uh, do some fencing with chicken wire sized fencing, uh, that will also help too. Okay, a couple more have come in here. Um, when is the best time, I'm assuming time, when is the best to transplant a Chinese peony? Chinese peony, ah, a wonderful group uh, of peonies, slightly different from our old fashioned type. Um, but Chinese peonies, uh, really the fall is a good time with those as well, um, as September. Uh, around Labor Day is a great time for peonies, um, either the fern leaf type, fern leaf or Memorial Day, and the, the Chinese type peonies, um, the other species type peonies, as well as the old fashioned. September seems to work quite well about Labor Day. Okay, have, um, wait, here I missed one there um, from Leslie. How do I work wood chip mulch into my garden already established perennials? All right, the uh, wood chips, if they're actually fairly, uh, 
uh, if, if they're wood chips with a fair amount of structure yet, it's better not to incorporate those down into the soil too far for the reason we mentioned a couple questions ago, because in the rotting process, uh, the little organisms will borrow some nitrogen fertilizer from the surrounding plants. So it's better to let um, wood chips that have some substance just remain on the surface and de decompose. Um, other products, organic products that are more broken down, uh, compost, uh, peat moss, things such as that, those are the types that can be worked down into the upper six to eight inches of soil. But the types of wood products that are more substantial uh, should stay on the surface until they break down. Okay, uh, have you had any luck starting lantana from seed? Lantana, no. You know, I, on my bucket list is to uh, have experienced uh, as many things plant-wise as I can. And I've never grown lantana from seed. Now, some lantanas are uh, propagated from cuttings, many of the type that are grown uh, and sold by a greenhouse. So lantana, I, I don't have any words of wisdom on lantana. <laughs> That's right. Uh, is it okay to plant herbs among the flowers? Herbs among flowers. It would depend on the types of herbs. And of course, herbs fall into also two categories. Some are perennials that come back from the roots. Others are just annual herbs that live for one season. Uh, and they would uh, do well among perennials, uh, except uh, the types that would be invasive. Some of the mint type herbs are very invasive and could become too competitive. Uh, so other than mints, um, chives can become, they can uh, seed themselves and uh, become uh, too spreading. So avoid the types that would be too invasive and, but um, non-invasive type herbs would do well in perennials and beds. Alrighty. Uh, do we need to be concerned with copyrighted plants? Copyrighted plants. Um, plants that have patents, which is fairly common now. A lot of the plants that we, uh, annual plants that we would buy and put in our planters, many of those are patented. And some of the perennials that we plant are patented. And so a person does uh, need to be aware of that. Uh, and uh, as a rule of thumb, any plant that is patented, uh, you cannot uh, propagate and sell the propagations. Uh, using it for your own, uh, your own use uh, is usually uh, permitted, but definitely not to propagate a patented plant uh, for resale. So a person would need to check on if, if the particular plant you had was patented. All right, last one here. Any recommendations on good places to buy seed starting supplies? Seed starting supplies. Uh, it's uh, fairly, uh, fairly easy to do a search on the internet for seed starting supplies, as, as you asked. Um, and there are a couple of uh, good companies. Well, one, let's see, I hope I get the name right. Uh, I believe it's a Gardener's Supply or Growing Supply. Uh, and many of these seed catalogs also have seed starting supplies. And I've also um, had very good success buying seed starting supplies at the local garden centers. Um, some of the home, uh, home improvement stores also supply them, but uh, garden centers have good seed starting supplies, things such as the um, the lights that would go above, you can use regular fluorescent lights, uh, but also the heating pads. Bottom heat uh, is very important when starting seeds indoors and garden centers sell heat pads, specially made for putting trays of germinating seeds. All right, I spoke too soon. There's uh, one comment and one more question here and then maybe we'll wrap it up. Uh, the one question, comment was that her fern leaf peony grows beautifully in the spring blooms beautifully then turns brown and withers and comes back the next year so she i think she's just saying that it gets kind of smothered by the surrounding plants yes the uh, fern leaf peony um which are uh, a very a beautiful 
uh, type species of peony. And that, that's kind of the way that they grow. Uh, they will come up early, bloom beautifully, but then that's what they tend to do. A bleeding heart tends to do the same too. By midsummer, oftentimes they've done what they needed to do for the summer, and then they just kind of turn brown and then go dormant, come back the next spring. Uh, one thing that a person can do, you don't need to do anything about that because it's natural, um, is to plant some annual flowers, not so much that they'd smother them, or detract, but just plant some in the near vicinity so it gives something else to look at for the remainder of the summer. All right, um, where, oh, the hydrangeas. So Carol has strawberry, vanilla, and limelight hydrangeas and they're bent over by the heavy snow. Are there any ideas for me? Uh, let's see, and there are two uh, categories of hydrangeas. Some come back from ground level each year, the big, great big round white flowered ones. So if the tops bend, no problem, they come back from the ground anyway. But the types that were mentioned, such as vanilla strawberry, they leaf out each year from the above ground branches. And um, they can take a good severe pruning. So if, if you can now, um, if they're bending too much, if you can go do some pruning on them to try to uh, make them less top heavy. Uh, I think after all this snow this winter, I think we're going to have a fair amount of pruning, myself included. Uh, so try to do a little bit of pruning maybe to so they aren't quite so uh, rambly and top heavy. That might help.